Uh, recently, I've been really thinking about how life can change in an instant. Uh, that phone call that's too late at night or too early in the morning, you wonder what's coming. Uh, just how quickly life can change. Rachel uh, just went through a difficult pregnancy. And, uh, you know, irregular heartbeat, blood pressure, a lot of other concerns. But it turned out to be pretty good. So we say, well, it really wasn't that bad. And if it hadn't turned out good, we would have said, oh, it was bad. Uh, Aaron, my brother Aaron, jumped out of a perfectly good airplane. <laughs> he busted up his leg pretty good, but all of us feel like, well, that's not too bad, you know, <laughs> jumping out of an airplane. Uh, other than that, he's fine. And so we joke about it, and we can joke about it, because brother Aaron, he's going to be okay, you know. But life can change fast. Cameron and the kids were driving home at night and were hit by a deer, badly damaging their van. But they're all fine, so it's just an inconvenience, and we get back to life as normal as quickly as we can, forget about it. A few days later, Dad was coming home from Madison, he had to slam on the brakes twice to avoid deer. And it caused him to realize something profound. He needs to get his brakes worked on. <laughs> uh, so he did. But dad is fine, and so we forget that story. Now, if he had hit the deer, or the deer come through the car, whatever else, he'd go off the side of the road, hit a tree. All those things happen, then we don't forget that story. Mom's cousin, Audrey, fell down recently. I mean, she seemed fine. She fell down a couple days later, and she died. Mom, Dad, Yumi, and I were at the funeral down in Elmhurst on Friday. Nobody was expecting her death. Now, her husband has cancer, and he's not doing well, and everybody thought he'd go first. But she fell down, and she died. Life can change in an instant, in a moment. Pick up that phone. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto man to die once. It is appointed unto mankind to die once, and after that, judgment. Just one shot. You die once, and after that, judgment. There are no second chances. There's no reincarnation. You're not going to bribe God with how much you put in the offering plate or, or with good behavior. One life, and then judgment. That's all we have. And God treats us like big boys and big girls. In other words, people say they want freedom, but they don't want any responsibility for the choices they make. God gives us more respect than that. He actually lays before us eternal salvation or eternal damnation. The choices we make in this life matter. God's given us that freedom. Last week, we saw that Jesus asked a question it's been like an echo through every generation since the time of Christ, through the Roman Empire, the, the, the fall of Rome, the rise of, of Europe, through, through our present day, the founding of the new world up to World War I, World War II, to our present day, the same question is echoed throughout every single generation. Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And you're a big boy and you're a big girl and your response matters. We saw last week in Mark 8, 34 through 38, Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants it, how do I get to heaven? Do you, want, do you want it? Do you want it? Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You see, you hear these questions Christ is asking? We need to be asking ourselves these questions. What good would it be if everything went my way? If every dream I ever had was fulfilled? If I got all the, if I made Bill Gates look poor? What, what, what good would it be if I lose my eternal soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, Jesus says, if anyone's ashamed of me, 
and my words in this messed up and sinful generation, in this messed up culture, Jesus says, the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, will be ashamed of them. If that person who's ashamed of me, he said, I'll be ashamed of them when he comes in my Father's glory, when I come in the Father's glory and with the holy angels. Unfortunately, most people don't know who Jesus is. Now, in the world, it's very true that many people have not even heard of the Bible. Many people have not only heard of Jesus Christ, but I'm talking in, in Western Europe, in the United States, most people have an image of who they think that Jesus is, and it's not true. When I hear people say, I hate church, and they tell me what they think church is, I, I usually think, yeah, I hate that too. <laughs> That's why we don't do it that way. Most people have an idea of God that isn't true. They have an idea of Jesus that isn't true. They have a warped view of him. Some people try to make God in their own image. Did you catch that? The Bible says we're made in God's image, but then we fell into sin. We're broken. The image of God is broken in us. We're not the people we should be. You know that in your heart. You're not the person you should be. You're not the person you wish you were. This is true for me. This is true for all of us. So we have the image of God, but we're broken. But most people, well, many people, try to make God into their own image. Just make it up as they go. Think about that. When I make up God in my own image, guess what? The things that I really can't stand, God really doesn't like those either. And the things that I'm pretty much okay with, God's cool. He's okay with that. We make God to look just like us. What does that mean? We're worshiping ourselves. When we make up God to look just like us, instead of putting him up here and saying, boy, his standards, his ways, I'm messed up. I got to get forgiveness. I got to get right with God. But when we make God, we just put our words into him. A loving God would never have hell. Therefore, there's no hell. A loving God would never judge this because uh, I don't judge it. But you know what? I can't stand people who, and I'm sure God doesn't like that either. See, see what we're doing? We are worshiping ourselves. It's idolatry. Oh, great and mighty myself. What do we think? Look at yourself. I'm looking at myself. It'd be stupid for me to worship myself. Right? Look at yourself. We want to we wanna hear the heavenly call of something that's more beautiful than we are, wiser than we are, better than we are, more loving than we are, and that's truthful. God's up here, we're down here. Don't worship yourself. It's a good start. Other people see Jesus through the lenses of their culture, and they just accept it. Well, Jesus was a nice, warm, and fuzzy guy. He liked sheep and lambs and stuff, didn't he? And, boy, Jesus was such a softy. He'd never say anything harsh to anybody, would he? Jesus is my buddy. Jesus is my homeboy. He's my pal. And they do, we just have these ideas about Jesus, and we never bother to check what Jesus actually said and did in the Bible. Do you think maybe that's stupid? Again? Silly? We can make up anything. I, you know, when, when Rachel was younger and would come and visit me in Japan, and, and she hadn't had babies yet, and she was much thinner. <laughs> Baby sister. I, I used to compare Rachel to a sumo wrestler, but I would not dare do that anymore. It's not funny. <laughs> and, and I would say to, to my congregation in Japan, none of you have met my sister Rachel. If I didn't show you a picture or describe her for you, you could make up any idea of her you wanted. And, and you could be very adamant. I think Rachel has blue hair and blot eyes, and, and, and she's very thin. And somebody else says, are you kidding me? The Rachel I know is a sumo wrestler. It, it, you could go back and forth, and everybody could get bent out of shape saying, I don't think Rachel would do this. I don't think Rachel would do that. And then I'd say, Rachel, come on in the back door. And she'd come walking up, and now you see what the real Rachel looks like. Why do people get bent out of shape? I don't think God would do. And how do you know that? Well, I just don't think. Well, I don't care. You know, you're just talking about stuff you don't know. I can make up stuff too. 
or if, if, if God actually loves us enough to show us his heart, to show us his mind, then we can find out what he really looks like. It's like if Rachel sent us a picture or a letter, we could know things about her for sure. Or Jesus, who came in person to show us himself. We just don't want to sit around and make things up, but our culture does it all the time. Most of us don't know who Jesus is. The title of this week's sermon is, Jesus is not who you think he is. Jesus is not who you think he is. He's, again, he's not your pal, he's not your buddy, he's not your homeboy, he's not cute, he's not warm and fuzzy, he's not like a precious moments figurine, he's not a weakling, he isn't a pushover. Everywhere Jesus went, he shook things up. Everywhere Jesus went, he caused trouble. And then his followers, everywhere they went, the culture changed. Everywhere they went, uh, Paul could be in, in, a, in a city less than three weeks and start a riot. Well, that's not very Christian. Because I mean, he was standing against false gods, idolatry, the lies that will steal people's hearts and bring them to hell. And we're more comfortable with that. And so we say, what was wrong with the early Christians that wherever they went, they stirred things up? Shouldn't they be? Well, I don't think Jesus was comfortable with people going to hell. Otherwise, he wouldn't have came and suffered and died on the cross. Why am I comfortable with people being eternal, eternally separated from everything that's good? All hope, all joy, all peace, all love comes from our Heavenly Father. Why would I be comfortable with people being separated from that? Jesus is not who you think he is. Before we read from chapter 9, I want you to remember last week we reached the halfway point in Mark. We began this relentless march to the cross. Jesus was born for the purpose of dying on the cross. This, this goal before him, he's, he set his face like flint, the Bible says. He just hardened his face. I'm going to go to that cross. He didn't like to die. He's the author of life. He wasn't suicidal. He loves life. But he loves us even more than his own comfort. And he went to endure rejection, beating, hardship, the physical pain of the cross, and then ultimately to have all my filth, nastiness, all, all the dark things in your heart, all the things you've ever said to somebody that you regret, all the things you've ever done that you regret, all that sin, the sins we don't even know about, was poured on Jesus Christ. He took responsibility for all our nastiness. And he set his face like flint, like a hard stone. I'm going to accomplish my mission. Let's look at uh, now Mark, chapter 9, 2 through 8. Jesus is not who you think he is. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. So he had his, he had his disciples, then he, then he had his followers, then he had a smaller group of 12 then he has an inner group of these three men, and he takes them up on a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. So that's kind of a cool insight into heaven. Yeah, you get to talk with Jesus. Here's Elijah, uh, Elijah and Moses, these great Old Testament prophets, and they suddenly appear right there. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, sensei, teacher, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, three tabernacles. It's like three little shrines there. Let's put up three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was talking about because he was so afraid. We don't worship prophets. That we, we should not set up a tabernacle for Elijah or for Moses. He didn't know what he was saying. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This morning, we're going to be reading the words of Jesus. This Bible is God's love letter to you. Listen to it. Listen to it. 
So what do we learn about Jesus here? He's not who you think he is. This is my son. God the Father says, my son, I love him, and you had better listen to him. Don't get all religious, start setting up shrines. Don't miss the point. Listen to my son. Listen to my son. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what does risen from the dead mean? Jesus is not just some guy. He's not just a great teacher. Jesus is not even just a prophet. It's not enough to say he's a great prophet. God the Father never affirmed any prophet like this. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Jesus is in a category far beyond Moses and Elijah. Last week, we saw this interesting thing in, in Mark chapter 8. Remember, Mark was not an apostle. Most of the early church thought these are the memoirs of Peter. Peter taught these things about Christ, and Mark wrote them down. And so we see Peter coming across as not looking very good, and the apostles not understanding. Remember that part there where Jesus said, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and the, and the Herodians. And, and we saw Peter, and, we, and they didn't understand. And Jesus said, don't you guys get it? So who told, them that, who told Mark this story the apostles didn't understand? Well, that was probably Peter. And then we see Peter... Uh, say to Jesus, uh, you, you are, you're the Messiah, you're the Son of God, you know, and God affirms, Jesus affirms that, saying, upon this rock I'm going to build my church. And then Jesus talks, starts talking about how he has to die, suffer and die. And Peter, when he hears Jesus say he's going to die, he scolds him. Bad move. Uh, and Jesus says, Satan, get out of my way. That was probably an embarrassing thing for Peter. Don't you think? Who told Mark about this episode? Well, probably Peter. Because this book is here to glorify God. Peter, Peter didn't want his memoirs written so that he could be glorified. This is all about Jesus. And this week, we're going to see the apostles still don't know why Jesus keeps talking about his death and resurrection. As, again, they're not getting it. And we're going to even see, in the middle of all the wonderful things Christ is doing, they're arguing with each other about who the greatest person is. Can you see that? They're right next to Jesus. They're traveling with Jesus. They're in church. And they're arguing who's the greatest. And again, we've talked about this many times. Don't think that uh, they're sitting there thinking, well, I'm a lot greater than you. <laughs> you think so? I'm way greater than you. People don't do it that way. They're talking, I was in prayer for two hours this morning. I've been in prayer like that for the last two months. Uh, I was able to share the gospel with 20 people in that village. That's wonderful. That's so good. I'm really glad that you're finally getting the night. I was able to do that, you know, 50 people yesterday. And that's the way Christians decide who's the greatest. We, 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 tell, we use Christianity to tell stories that are really used to make us look good. And so they're right there with Jesus, and Jesus just calls it as it is. He knows it. These people are all about themselves. All right, let's read. Now from, uh, from verse 9, 9 through 13. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen. Uh, again, because Jesus doesn't want to attract these crowds, he has a certain point of time he wants to die. He's on his own schedule. Uh, until they've seen the Son of Man risen from the dead, they kept the matter to themselves, discussing what, what does rising from the dead mean? And they asked him, why did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? They just saw Elijah. Why do did, why did, why did people say the Old Testament says Elijah has to come first before the Messiah? And Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first, restores all things. But when it is written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected. But I tell you, Elijah has come. And they have done to him everything they wish, just as written about him. <coughs> And that's uh, probably John the Baptist we're talking about here. He came in the spirit of Elijah. 
Jesus here, we said Jesus is not who you think he is. Jesus here, he calls himself the Son of Man again. If you notice, he's been calling himself the Son of Man a lot. Actually, in the Bible, this is Jesus' favorite way to talk about himself. He calls himself the Son of Man, the Son of Man, again and again and again. And one of the reasons he says this is to fulfill prophecy. Because uh, by suffering, being rejected, and dying, the Old Testament talks about the Son of Man being a, a messianic figure. The Messiah is the Son of Man. But there's something else that's going on here. Jesus, God incarnate, is saying, I became a human being in order to pay for human sin with my life. I'm identifying with humans in their suffering. God says, I'm one of you guys. The Son of Man, I'm identifying with human beings in their sufferings, with their sin. These same humans that I love, that I came to die for, will torture me, reject me, and kill me. I'm the Son of Man. I'm with you. God, uh, Jesus is God with us. There's something really beautiful there about God becoming flesh and saying, I'm a son of man. I'm a son of man. I'm enduring life from your perspective. I know the temptation you go through. I know the trials you go through. I know the pain you go through, the disappointment. And all that sin and darkness in your heart, because I'm one of you, I'm going to take responsibility for that. I'm going to take that. I'm gonna... God is distant. God is other. We know that. God is holy. We're not. But God decided to come close to us. We could never reach God. But God incarnated himself. He, Jesus, the Bible says, he put aside all his glory, all, all, his prerogative as God, all his prerogatives as God. He set them aside and became one of us with us. I'm a son of man. And so what we couldn't do, because we could never get up to him, God came down from us. So God, who's distant and holy, and righteous and pure, came down right next to us to live life with us and took all our sin upon himself. The, the next episode in chapter 9 once again shows Christ's utter superiority with demonic forces. There is no contest. There is no contest. This idea in Hollywood that there's a battle between good and evil, or, or even in, in Eastern mysticism, you know, the yin and the yang, life and, and death, light and dark, and strength and weakness, and life and death, which I said again, uh, good and bad, all these things, and, and perfect balance. No, that's not true. Uh, C.S. Lewis described it beautifully. He said, uh, sometimes people think the universe is in balance between creation and destruction. And there's this cycle of birth and death and rebirth, and it keeps, he said, but that's not the way it works. Imagine two very strong men with a big boulder in between them, and they both, they're equally matched, so they get on the opposite side of the boulder. Does the boulder roll this way for a while, then roll this way for a while, then roll? He says, no, nothing happens. If good and evil were equal, if God was equal, if creation and destruction were equal, nothing would ever happen. The fact that we have a universe here, that we have goodness, and you can have goodness, by the way, without badness. But you can't have badness unless goodness exists. Think about a lie. A lie can't exist unless there's a truth. But you can have truth without lies. Yeah. Uh, life can exist without death, but you can't have anything die unless life existed first. God is superior. God is superior. And we're going to see here that when, G when there's a confrontation between Jesus and these demonic, dark forces, and remember, demons are angels who chose to walk away from God. They're going to say, no, we're not going to do things God's way. We're going to do things our own way. These fallen angels, they're no match for the Son of God. They're no match for Jesus Christ. So let's look at this now. Uh, Mark chapter 9 from verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. So Peter, James, and John, and Jesus just had this incredible moment up on the mountain with the Mount of Transfiguration. They get down. The other disciples are involved in this argument with these, with these Jewish teachers, and they're probably pretty happy to see Jesus come. As soon as the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. So everybody else is happy to see Jesus too. And Jesus said, what are you guys arguing about? Which is a good question. And a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought with you my son who is possessed by a demon. 
that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, na mouth, gnashing his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked you disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Let's skip down to 25 now, 25 through 27. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he didn't want this to be all about the wrong focus, just showing off miracles. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, because I have authority. I'm the boss. Come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Isn't that beautiful? I'm not going to dwell on this scene too much, but we've seen this before. Jesus has authority. Jesus has power. There's no contest between the forces of hell and, and, and Jesus Christ. But I want us right now to think about that little boy. I don't know how old he was. Think about that boy. People looked at him and thought he was dead. And Jesus grabbed him by the hand and he lifted him on his feet to a new life, to a brand new life without this demonic affliction. Maybe people have written you off before too. And treated you as if you were as good as dead. But when Jesus reaches out and grabs you by the hand. He lifts you up out of that state of near death and puts you on your feet and you prove them wrong by the power of Jesus because with Jesus, Jesus tells us with faith, all things are possible. It doesn't matter what mess you're in. It doesn't matter how hard your life is. It doesn't matter who has written you off, who thinks there's no hope for you. Jesus can see hope in you. And if you will grab his hand, there's new life waiting for you. Jesus wants to lift you up, brothers and sisters. Don't stay down. Grab hold of that hand. Believe. This is what Jesus does. This is his job. He's the savior. He saves. He wants to save all of us, everyone who will come to him in faith. Reach out your hand. Let's finish up now from 30 to 37. You know what? I'm not finished yet. Let's keep going. But we are going to do uh, 30 to 37 now. Uh, they left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where he, they were because he was teaching his disciples. He needed some special time to teach his inner group, his inner core. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered over to human hands. He will be killed, and after three days he will rise. But they didn't understand what he meant. <laughs> okay, I'm going to be delivered over to the authorities. I'm going to be killed. After three days, I'm going to rise again. What the heck is he talking about? You know, it just didn't click for them. They, they could not even conceive. There must be like some spiritual meaning here. There must be something like deeper about this. And they weren't getting what they meant. And again, they're looking pretty silly. And who wrote this? This is, the, this is Peter. This is, the, this is the apostles who are telling the story. They came to Capernaum uh, where... where when he was in the house, and this is probably Peter's house maybe, and, and he asked them, what are you arguing about? What were you arguing about on the road? And of course he knew. But they kept quiet because on the way they had been arguing about who's the greatest. <laughs> so they're all, they're all talking, and again, they're probably saying, I did all these spiritual things, and I did all these spiritual things, and recently I've been really close to the Lord, you know. And, and Jesus said, by the way, what are you guys talking about when we were walking? wants to answer because when God when Jesus comes into our into our life 
We can't make excuses for the darkness anymore. They, when they were just hanging out with other guys that were messed up as them, it's easy to argue about who the greatest is. The Jesus is right there, and you kind of don't want to argue about who's the greatest anymore. He's the greatest. And they didn't have anything to say. Uh, let's start again. When they left that place and passed through Galilee, Jesus did not want anyone to know where they, where they were because he was teaching his disciples. So we have an insight into God's heart here. He wants to teach everybody, save everybody, but he, his ministry is to preach to an inner core so that they can go out and preach as well. Uh, because he was teaching the disciples, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered over to human hands. He will be killed, and after three days he will rise. But they didn't get it, and they were afraid to ask him about it. When they came to Capernaum, when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you guys arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, that's beautiful. He sits down, he calls over the 12. Okay, guys, come on. What are you guys talking about on the road? Don't want to say, it. all right, guys, gather around. Come on, guys, we're going to talk. Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last. It has to be the servant of all. Well, think about this. This is mighty God of mighty gods, is Lord of lords, is King of kings in this huge, vast universe with all of its mysteries, quasars and black holes and pulsars. God made all of this. He became human, and he came to serve us. To, we spit on him. We abused him. He came in order to love us and to bring us salvation. He says, do you guys really want to be great? you got to stop trying to act great all the time. Stop trying to be a big deal. Stop trying to make it all about you and start actually caring about other people. This is what greatness looks in God's eyes. The greatest of all became humble. The Bible says he humbled himself even unto death, death on a cross. The greatest of all laid aside his glory in order to love us. Brothers and sisters, we look like fools when we're all puffed up. And we're worried about my ego and your pride. We're bumping into each other, getting offended, holding on to grudges, pouting. I mean, we got a dust, a little dust ball of a planet in this universe. God came down to earth. And we can't let go of it when somebody's hurt our pride. How foolish, how silly, silly. Jesus says, do you want to be great? It's about other people. Serve other people. Love other people. Encourage other people. Be a, be a blessing. Let your life count. Make it a blessing to the other people, to those who are around you. Do you want to be great? Serve others. And he took a little child whom he placed among them. Come over here, little kid. And the little kid came in the middle. And you know how little kids take a worm when they're in the middle of a bunch of adults? So Jesus took him in his arms. Because this guy's going to move around. Isn't that a beautiful picture? God. Hey, guy. You got big cheeks. I like that. You know, I made that. That's my idea. And, and so he's got this little kid in his arms. He says, whoever welcomes one of these really cute, adorable little children, my name welcomes me. Now, in that culture, children were not that big a deal. It, it, it wasn't like it is today. Children were little adults. They couldn't do much to help you survive. People were on a survival basis. They couldn't work yet, the little ones. As soon as they got big enough, they were required to work to help the family. The children could not contribute. And Jesus said, this little one who can't contribute, when you just pour love on one like this, you're pouring love on me. God says, you're loving me when you love these little kids. Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, not only welcomes me, but the one who sent me, God the Father. Verse 41, skip down there, 41 to the end. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives a cup of water, just a cup of water in my name, because you belong to the Savior, will surely be rewarded. 
Whenever, sometimes we worry, oh, somebody's taking advantage of me. Well, maybe they were. They're twits. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip you off because you have a good heart. Okay, that's between you and Jesus. But I'm going to get a blessing because I try to do good unto you, and God sees my heart. But yeah, <laughs> I, I ripped you off. Yeah, okay, fine. See how it goes for you. Brothers and sisters, don't worry if somebody gets, they think they got one over on you. If God saw your heart was to bless, you will be rewarded. Now, I'm not saying to, to go out there and be taken advantage of on purpose. I'm not saying throw out your reason or your thought. But sometimes we really feel burdened or hurt, like, oh, I think that person just ripped me off. Well, who did they really rip off? They're ripping themselves off because there's some little, little punk who's so wrapped up and trying to get something that's not rightfully theirs that they're offending the God of the universe. And when you say, I really want to help this person, and you do, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how they accept it. God sees your heart. And when we try to bless people in the name of Jesus Christ, you will be rewarded. Did you catch that? You will be rewarded. You will be rewarded. God never sees us love other people in his name, and he doesn't bless. We have a God who loves to bless. And again, I'm not talking about throwing money down a hole. I'm not talking about will, uh, getting yourself taken advantage of on purpose. I'm talking about not holding on to that bitterness or that grudge or that regret. Let it go. That person has to deal with Almighty God, and you get a blessing. It's a kind of good exchange. You couldn't give enough to, to equal the way God will bless you. God always outgives us. God is, God is a great giver. When we learn to give, we're just copying him. We're just learning to be like our papa. We look up at our daddy. He's shaving. Not, not really. Over here. I want to shave. It, if we look up at our Heavenly Father and we see him working on something, we like that. And we see our Heavenly Father loves people and blesses people and who's willing to lay down his life for other people, you say, oh my goodness, I'm starting to get it. This whole world's messed up and I'm messed up because I'm, we're, all, oh, we're all only thinking about ourselves. And that's not the way it works. When people learn to love and to care and to say, I really, really want to see you blessed. I want to see goodness in your life. I have goodwill towards you. I want to see the Lord in your life. Then we're starting to have the heart of Jesus. The same heart he had on the cross when he died for me. It's not about me. I don't want to waste my life pouting. I don't want to waste my life with regret. I don't want to waste my life holding on to grudges. I don't want to waste my life with bitterness. I want my life to count by being just like Jesus, by learning to love people the way he does, by caring about the things that he cares about. And Jesus says, Jesus, remember God the Father said, this is my son, I'm pleased with him, listen to him. Jesus says, when you bless people in my name, you're going to be blessed. This is the words of Jesus. This is, the, this is the heart of God himself. Then verse 42, and remember I said, you don't know Jesus. The world ain't got a concept. If anyone causes one of these little ones, these guys with their cute cheeks, if anyone causes one of these little guys, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Okay. Now, Jesus, was that really called for? And Jesus say, yeah, I thought so. I mean, that's why I said it. We, uh, we like to sleepwalk through life. Don't shock me. Don't, don't, don't upset the boat. It's not polite to talk about heaven and hell. Jesus didn't care about any of that. Why is it that the Bible talks about sin, the Bible talks about the bloody cross where Jesus died for our sin in order to save us from hell so that we can go to heaven. And today we've got so many so-called churches that will not talk about the cross, won't talk about hell, won't talk about sin. You know that warm and fuzzy Jesus? 
talked about hell more than anybody else in the Bible. Because he wants to save us. That's his job. He's the savior. He says, I don't want anybody to go to hell. And it'd be better if you're going to lead a child astray. If by your life, by the way we act and talk and, <clears throat> and our priorities, it causes children not to prioritize God in their life. Jesus said it'd be better for you if you just tied a big stone around your neck to jump in the ocean. Because God is going to have wrath. God is going to come down. Because God doesn't want anybody to miss eternal salvation, eternal joy. In heaven. You know, Paul never used the word hell. Now, he talked about eternal destruction. He talked about hell. But people have this image like Paul was strict and Jesus was nice and warm and fuzzy. Jesus talked about hell all the time. Well, we want to have a, we want to have a church that's nice and encouraging and, and, and cute. So we're just going to ignore Jesus in this. <laughs> what? Not a church then, right? Everybody's with me? Why did Jesus talk about this? I keep saying it because he loves us. You are loved. He died for you. He laid down his life for you. I was listening to a, a story by Ravi Zacharias, great Christian uh, teacher, apologetist, apologist. And uh, he was talking about a dog that he had the family, that the family loved. It was really his wife's dog. And this dog was a faithful family member. And one day when the dog was old, he woke up and the door, dog was laying by their bedroom door and he was breathing from his stomach and could, couldn't move. He could hardly roll his eyes and he was obviously suffering in pain, whimpering. And he knew the dog was going to die, so he called his wife, because it's really his wife's dog. And he uh, said, honey, I think the dog's on its way out. And he's watching that dog, trying to comfort the dog, and the dog can't move. And then the dog hears the wife's car. And he struggled to even turn his head towards the door. And Ravi Zegger says, and I could not believe it. Somehow that dog found the strength to get up and go to the door and greet the master and the wife came in. The dog looked up and felt that at him. He said, uh, and I love dogs too, he said, I don't think anyone could watch that scene of devotion and not wept. Brothers and sisters, I read recently that in recent times, oh, around a million Christians have died for their faith in Jesus Christ. I have no way to verify that number. I know a lot of Christians have been dying uh, in the last 15 years for Christ. Um, reliable sources say that more, more Christians are dying today than at the time of the Roman Empire. Are we devoted to our master to lay down at his feet and die? But here's the clincher. Our master already died for us, and he doesn't see us as a pet. He calls us his children. This Jesus that we're reading about keeps telling his apostles, I'm going to go and die, but I'm going to raise again. He came to die. And then he says, and I want you to live your life to bring more people into this kingdom. Don't do anything that would cause a little child to miss me. And yeah, if we're called to, we can crawl over to the door and die at the feet of our master knowing that he's going to open that door and we're going to wake up in paradise forever to be with him. We've got a good God. Jesus, that warm, cute guy that doesn't rock the boat, that's not the Jesus I'm talking about. The Jesus that was hammered to a cross by people that hated them and looked down from the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't even have a clue. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know who I am. That's the Jesus that we need to lift up in our culture. This is the Jesus that can change your life, that can change your eternal destiny because heaven and hell are real places. So verse 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. 
If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter li eternal life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, I really want to say this. Uh, when the, I believe it was the Tyndale Bible was made, before that time, there weren't a lot of Bibles that regular people could read. They were maybe Latin and Greek Bibles, but this book was printed that usual people could read. And, and there was a famous story where, where a monk got up to preach, and he said that this Bible is an abomination. We need to read it only in Latin, because when usual people read this passage, it will be a destruction to the country because so many people will have their eyes plucked out and be going around blind that our society will fall apart. <coughs> and the following week, another monk, I think a monk, preacher got up and said, usual people have enough sense to understand a metaphor when they see one and to understand that a fox dressed up in a monk's robe is not really a fox. In other words, that guy who spoke last week who said that we shouldn't be reading this, uh, he's just a fox in the hen house. He's trouble. We should be reading our Bibles. This, uh, when you go to heaven, you're not crippled and you're not maimed. So obviously, Jesus is not talking literally here. He is saying, whatever is in your life that will keep you from knowing me, you better cut it out because you don't want to miss heaven. What is it that you're so infatuated with? What is it that owns your soul? At what price are you willing to sell your soul? It's better if you cut that out of your life because you want to go to heaven. You do not want to go to hell because hell is for keeps. It's appointed unto man to die once and then judgment. That's that whole thing where their worm does not die and the fire is not. What is that? What is, all he says is hell is for keeps. There is no end to it. Just like we're resurrected to either eternal life in heaven or eternal death in hell. Then Jesus says, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. And here Jesus ends this whole section talking about his death and resurrection. He says, salt is a preservative. Salt adds flavor. Salt keeps things good. Jesus says, Christian, my followers, have salt in yourself. Be at peace with other Christians. This is the heart of God. He wants his kids to get along. As a parent, you can know that. Come on. I want you guys to love each other. I want you guys to get along. I want you guys to build each other up, to be a blessing with each other. Yeah, but I'm greater than him. And How long do I have to put up with you guys? You know? Brothers and sisters, God, peering in a cloud with his mighty voice, said, this is my son. I love him. Listen to him. Brothers and sisters, God is telling us this morning, have salt in your heart. Preserve. Don't be a force of destruction. Be a blessing to others. Don't be a curse. Bring the light of Jesus. Don't bring darkness. Don't you dare do anything that would keep people from knowing me. Not just the little kids, but anybody. Instead, we want our lives to be used to bring people to him, right? Right? Amen. And then he says, and brothers and sisters, and in me, I want you to be at peace with one another. And I really can't say, boy, I don't want to be too dogmatic about this. I don't want to be too, uh, what is it, pedantic? I don't want to be too adamant about these things. When it's, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Have salt in your lives and be at peace with one another. We cannot say these things too strongly. Let's pray. Lord God, our culture doesn't know you. The world doesn't know you. We often create you in our own image. We often create you so that you're cute and not threatening. We try to pretend that you're safe. But Lord God, you are mighty. Your son is mighty. Help us to see Jesus as he really is. Help us to see ourselves as you see us, Lord. Help us to fall at your feet and live lives for you or die for you, whatever you call us to do, Lord. And Father, in this life, I pray that 
we don't worship ourselves, but we worship you. Lord, help us to be salt and light like a city on a hill. Help us to love our brothers and sisters and help us to be at peace with one another. Lord, all these things are foreign to our sin nature, but they come naturally from you, so help us to be close to you. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for everyone here. I pray that you will give a special blessing to everyone who uh, got out of bed this morning and made the effort to be here at church, Lord. Uh, we, want, we want to know you, we want to love you, and we want to be your people. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you for watching Foundation TV. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.